numerous reports indicate that manufacturing is emerged as the favorite target of ransomware groups and hackers. In response, a new report from Industrial Media discusses the evolution of industrial cybersecurity, its current state, and the tactics hackers are using, including phishing schemes, malware, and ransomware attacks. It also details solutions in Army manufacturers with the knowledge and resources needed to win more fights on this highly complex and ultra-competitive battlefield. Download the industrial sector's new battlefield by going to manufacturing.net backslash cyber. Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. We've touched on the challenges of obtaining the proper levels of financial support on Security Breach quite a number of times. And while the justifications for additional cybersecurity spending is easy to explain to this audience, getting buy-in at the C-level can, can be difficult. Well, maybe some recent research can help you win over those controlling the purse strings. Sonic Wall's mid-year cyber threat report found that their firewalls were under attack 125% of the time during a 40-hour work week. And if that doesn't get the attention of the powers that be, it might also be worth mentioning that during these attacks, Sonic Wall also found that, at a minimum, 12.6% of all revenues were exposed to cyber threats that were not covered by security tools or procedures. Extra Hops Global Cyber Confidence Index also reported that 31% of cyber and IT leaders want more budget. It's not a surprise, but to be more accurate, they want a 50% increase in order to effectively manage and mitigate cyber risk. That number might seem a bit inflated, but it does help illustrate how we're seemingly fighting the cyber battle on multiple fronts. Here to help sort through some of these challenges and help direct our resources as effectively as possible is Anusha Iyer. She's the founder and CEO of Korsha, a leading provider of OT asset management and access security solutions. Anusha, thanks so much for joining us today and welcome to Security Breach. We'll just jump into some of the bigger issues that we're dealing with when it comes to OT cybersecurity in the manufacturing sector. The big thing is we've got so many more connections. We're embracing all this Industry 4.0 technology, and it's great, but it's giving us more assets that we need to cover in terms of our threat landscape. From your perspective, what are you seeing as some of the bigger issues that are evolving from more of these connections and, and more of these con connected devices? Yeah, I mean, it is as you said, both a, a huge opportunity, but does present some unique challenges. Um, you know, one that comes to mind is legacy infrastructure, right? Yeah. So a lot of industrial networks um, have legacy operational technology that oftentimes predates modern IT constructs, right? A lot of this equipment was not designed with modern cybersecurity controls like identity, authentication, access control in mind. And so when you suddenly start networking a 20, 25 year old PLC with IT infrastructure, it requires retrofitting some of those modern security practices into these enclaves. And, you know, more often than not, I think it's kind of a really um, interesting time in terms of an opportunity for cyber to really kind of be a, a bridge towards getting to connectivity for industry 4.0. Yeah. Another is optimizing for uptime, right? Most of the yeah. critical infrastructure and most of these manufacturing systems, they operate in real time environments where the microseconds can make a difference. And, you know, from a cyber threat perspective, I think um, industrial networks in general is are really where the threat can almost become kinetic, right? And yeah. so security measures that are being introduced, they do introduce latency and they have the um, sometimes impact to disrupt processes that can lead to, to even physical damage and, and physical safety issues. And so any kind of uh, system solutions we're introducing and, and introducing for the sake of connectivity really demands kind of a careful balance between cyber and real-time operations to you know, optimize for safety and uptime. Absolutely. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, as you say, you brought up a bunch of great stuff that we can dive into there a little bit. I was hoping the first thing we could talk about is machine identity. Understanding all, everything that's out there is a challenge, and knowing everything, it shouldn't be. But again, as we're making all these new connections, bringing in all this new technology and connecting it to the legacy stuff, 
we lose track of these assets when we're putting together our cyber plans. What are some strategies that you've seen to be effective to make sure we know and can identify everything that's out there or as much of it as possible? Yeah, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Discovery is um, absolutely the first step to take, right? Like what is getting connected into industrial networks? And I, uh, I think my experience has been that sometimes there is a, um, a false confidence that comes with traditionally air-gapped networks, right? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes what we find in these industrial settings is, you know, the, the, the cybersecurity strategy is, well, I have my, my controller and my HMIs and I have this like air gapped enclave and nothing else can connect. Right. But that's not really what's happening in practice because then you're either kind of strapped from not being able to apply updates, not being able to apply like modern kind of security controls to it. But also when you have a vendor that walks by and needs to update their system for whatever reason, they are going to have to connect, right? And that's oftentimes what happens. And these vendor laptops can move from one air-gapped network to another and you don't know what they're passing through. So when we talk about a machine identity strategy, absolutely like discovery and mapping out all of the assets and the connections that are happening in that industrial network is, um, you know, top priority first step. And then... What does it look like after that? Well, once you know these are the connections you want to allow, we want to bring in strong identity and authentication for these automated connections, right? So today, oftentimes that's limited to like, identity is oftentimes limited to like static network identifiers, like IP addresses or MAC addresses. And, um, you know, the basic authentication that is sometimes available with the equipment like passwords or, you know, something that inevitably could be hard coded somewhere. Obviously, these are easily stealable, spoofable, easy targets for adversaries. And when we are broadening what the threat surface is with Industry 4.0 and potentially connecting all the way out to cloud, we have to up level things like identity and authentication. So especially with OT communications that are kind of largely machine to machine automated controls like role based access, least privilege, and even, you know, like multi factor authentication or defense yeah. in depth are a great, great way to introduce, um, you know, multiple levels of identity and access into a, a traditionally flat network. Yeah. Um, then observability and continuous monitoring, right? Because when you look at discovery, it's got to be an ongoing thing. You can't map out a network yeah. and say it's done. Like these industrial networks, and especially with Industry 4.0, are very dynamic. So how do you detect new connections? How do you have continuous monitoring for unusual behavior, even from maybe what was seemingly a trusted asset? Yeah. So no one would disagree with anything you just said there. It all makes total sense, and we're all on board with it. But when we start rattling off all the different steps involved there, it can seem very, very daunting, especially if you're needing to make some investments, whether it be in people, platform, software, whatever the case is. What tips would you give to folks to make sure they're not trying to you know, drink the ocean, eat the elephant, whatever you want to say, to make this a more manageable process because it is so important? It's something we can't just stick our head in the, in the sand about. Yeah, I would say what we have found, you know, so we're doing a lot of work right now with the Air Force in terms of um, uh, demonstrating kind of the value of Industry 4.0 and demonstrating even, you know, like leveraging um, models and predictive analytics and kind of all of the promise and vision of Industry 4.0. But what's been really successful for us is um, stage it, pick yeah. You know, like, you know, you may uh, a normal shop floor may have maybe 30 different enclaves, right? Pick um, one or two that you want to start with and kind of start with a smaller scope, start with then, you know, everything scales down in terms of the number of assets you have to manage in terms of what you want to retrofit. And um, obviously, you know, a big challenge on the OT side is kind of the lack of protocol standardization and a lot of like vendor proprietary communications. I think a big advantage with cloud is the embrace of um, 
open source and open standards in terms of majority of traffic is, you know, probably like HTTP REST, right? You have some other things, you have streaming and all of that, but that's not the case in an OT network. And so I'd say as you're introducing um, new vendors, new equipment, setting up new configurations, um, keeping an eye towards embracing protocol standards like OPC UA, like MT Connect, and kind of veering vendors towards that would be a great way to get broader coverage, I guess. No, it makes sense. Tapping into a lot of those suppliers as well is, it can be a key asset for, for manufacturers or anybody in the industrial sector. I think one of the things, too, that comes about is, as we're seeing all of these new connections, and you mentioned it before, we've got a lot of legacy equipment out there, so there's upgrades that need to take place. We're connecting new stuff to old stuff. Where do you see sort of, I guess the, maybe the term I'm looking for, the responsibility when it comes to that secure by design dynamic? We see a lot of manufacturers coming very heavily on, whether it's the, the new supplier of that technology, or you mentioned cloud. They're depending on the cloud provider to also provide security, but they have some responsibilities themselves. What tips would you give in terms of managing that dynamic as sort of this shared responsibility when it comes to all these connection points? Yeah, and, and you alluded to it too of, you know, the the key piece there is the collaboration and training, right? Yeah. And um, whether it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic when we're talking about traditionally maybe IT focused um, analytics and in architectures and infrastructures, things like cloud and the cloud shared responsibility model. But then you're bringing it into this world of operators that, um, you know, I'll say walking shop floors, I've seen a few times still passwords kind of, you know, uh, prominently yeah. placed near workstations and things because, yeah. you know, understandably, like that's just a small portion of an operator's job is to work is to their primary purpose is to make sure that manufacturing shop floor is operating and they're producing parts they're you know doing sustainment and so there's a huge training aspect to it in terms of establishing this collaborative environment between OT and IT teams where we're fostering that shared responsibility for security and regular training sessions just like we've become accustomed to on um information networks, right? Like phishing training, ransomware training, about evolving threats, best practices, and why we need to adhere to security protocols, uh, I think goes a long way. And as industries um, continue to embrace the digital transformation of securing the communication and data flow across OT into IT systems, I think starts with delineating where that handoff happens. Right, so I I own it up to this point, and I own the security guarantees of the network up to this point, and then we hand off, and now it becomes your responsibility. And really, what gets me excited about this opportunity around cyber and Industry 4.0 is I think what we are all realizing is that the only real perimeter is identity, right? Whether mm -hmm. that is machine to machine, whether that is human to machine. Um, network boundaries are kind of uh, melting away, right? And that's yeah. where when you look at like zero trust, when you look at industry 4.0, when you look at OT to IT, right? It's becoming very gray where OT ends and IT begins. Yeah, I think that's what we want. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, that's exactly what we want. I think we're still experiencing, unfortunately, a lot of siloing of those activities between IT and OT. What have you seen there in terms of, is this relationship between those two, uh, two areas of the enterprise, is it improving? Or have there been things you've seen to sort of help, help get out of those silos and get those folks working together a little more closely? Yeah, I mean, I think cyber, our experience has been is like cybersecurity teams um, are still largely perceived as like blockers on the OT side, right? Oh, so yeah. we've, had, we've had like customers, it's really interesting. We have customers come to us that have said, you know, our cyber folks just will not allow us to connect these things. We need to figure out how to connect and that's all we care about, right? And so yeah. true, right? If you want yeah. to get at data, if you want to get kind of the 
you know, the benefits of real-time data sharing, the predictive analytics, all of that, you need the real-time connections. And actually it's a, you know, at the end of the day, it's a stronger cybersecurity story because then it's a monitored connection. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there's still a lot of bridge building that needs to happen between um, security teams and like the personas that are actually operating uh, industrial equipment. You're right, it's still very siloed but it's about how do we communicate from a cybersecurity perspective the benefits of um, being more security minded, doing the security by design, and kind of building those those strategies in right. So whether yeah. it's identity and authentication, whether it's network segmentation, or you know having a story for backups and continuous monitoring, um, it's you know it's a little bit of do we what's that balance between like carrot and stick? Like there's certainly more regulatory drivers that are coming into place on the OT side with industrial networks. And then I think industry 4.0 is more of the carrot. Here are the benefits that you get from, you know, securely connecting. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. You've met, you've alluded to it a couple of times here. We're talking about all this technology. We're talking about cybersecurity. We're talking about a lot of capital investments and all these connections. But at the end of the day, it also comes down to the people factor, the human element of cybersecurity and how important that is. And I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about a lot of what you're describing here is culture. We need people to embrace the fact that they play a big part in cybersecurity, whether it's making sure the password isn't on the sticky note attached to the HMI or, or whatever the case is. So maybe you could talk a little bit about getting buy-in, things you've seen work there, and, and especially at the C-suite level where we need more investment in cybersecurity as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is, there's definitely a culture mind shift that sort of like needs to happen where, um, I think, you know, what motivates folks is understanding the why and that education around the importance of cyber hygiene accounts, data access that I think we've come to learn on the, um, you know, the IT side of enterprises where we all know, okay, we're not going to put our passwords on a sticky underneath our laptops, right? Or yeah. we're going to enable multi-factor authentication and that kind of defense in depth with um, logging into critical systems or really these days, any system. Well, that um, importance has to be emphasized from the C-suite level all the way down where for years operators uh, and maybe automation engineers on a shop floor have been trained to optimize for uptime in production. Now with industry 4.0, cyber identity, that data protection, just have to kind of be elevated as first class citizens on that priority list. (laughs) Um, And then also, you know, further, it's a a little bit of uh, using the capitalism, right? Like OEMs, vendors, we really, you know, enterprises can really push to prioritize some of these modern security controls, things like encrypted communications into equipment, right? And um, having a growing accountability on these vendors to elevate cyber, it's starting to happen through regulations. And, you know, we're seeing entities like MITRE highlighting CVEs and NIST incorporating OT security into their guides. So it's, I think, again, it's kind of like that balance of like benefit versus compliance drivers, right? So September, like we've been tracking, I think in September of 2023, NIST released an updated version of um, 882, right? The Guide to Operational Technology Security. And some really cool stuff in there where they kind of expanded the scope from just to be kind of a broader category of OT rather than just yeah. industrial control systems, but focused so much on concepts like zero trust and identity and access and really advocates for a defense and depth strategy, right? Where, yeah, you want the vendors to play ball, you want to upgrade the equipment, but the reality of today is you may not be able to do that, right? The shelf life of a particular piece of equipment may still have 10, 15 years in it. How do you retrofit cybersecurity and identity and access, even given some of those constraints. 
Yeah, it's an interesting and ongoing challenge, but there, like you've alluded to a couple of times, there's a lot of resources out there, whether it's MITRE, whether it's NIST, working with your suppliers. And I think one of the greatest advancements that I've seen in industrial cybersecurity over the last probably three, four years is a greater level of transparency. There's more data that's being shared, whether it's about the hacks, the solutions, the tools, or whatever it may be. When you look at that, now some of that's been forced through regulatory actions, like you also alluded to, do you feel that's the main driver or is the industry starting to come together a little bit more and willingly sharing a little bit more data? I think it's it's both, right? Yeah. Um, I think certainly the threat landscape for industrial control systems has just exploded and okay. maybe there's an element of, um, you know, having an improved posture by doing it as a community, right? I think yeah. that's been a lot of the benefits of like cyber on the IT side. It is It has become much more of like community driven, like threat intel and so forth. So it's great to see that um, when we're talking about kind of new strains and advanced attacks targeting like critical infrastructure and energy manufacturing, uh, transportation, water treatment. So I think also we're seeing uh, like evolving malware families of just like even previous strains of maybe you know five years ago you take you know like a stuxnet and now you're seeing new strains of it again that's targeting newer protocols newer um plcs and certainly you know i think the whole ai age um industrial networks are not immune to it. And we're seeing a lot of like AI powered, like ICS based malware. So some of it is regulatory driven. Some of it is like, you know, kind of dealing with the reality of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, when you talk about like autonomous malware, for example, like the rise of AI powered ICS malware can, can have a pretty substantial impact. And so you kind of have to have trust in the connections in your network and, you know, have a strong identity story there. Absolutely. No, it's, it's interesting when you bring up that malware. I think since they busted Lockbit, it's reappeared in like three or four different three. names or, or yeah. something like that. So it's, <laughs> it, it is kind of crazy. Uh, Anusha, a lot of great information you're sharing with us. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about, uh, about your company uh, and tell us a little bit more what Korsha is about and what they're up to. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to. So Korsha is an identity provider for machines where, you know, we're working to allow OT enterprises to securely connect, move data, really automate with confidence from anywhere to anywhere. And we're using zero trust principles to essentially build secure identity and access to diverse OT equipment um, up and down the Purdue model, right? From mm -hmm. whether that's inside or outside your industrial network. And a lot of our innovation has been around how can we draw parallels from where it's worked with human identity and access management. So concepts like uh, multi-factor authentication, right? And we have even kind of a almost think of it like an automated Google Authenticator for OT assets and connections to OT assets. And whether it's OPC UA or whether it's HTTP REST, we're able to kind of provide that layer of identity where we can really help pin automated communication between trusted players across networks. Um, and interestingly enough, I will say we are a little bit new to the OT space. So we're a cybersecurity company based in the DC area. And I started the company a few years ago and we're focused on machine to machine communications, right? And so to me, my background is uh, basically cyber, but on the, the IT side for quite some time. And so to me, when I was defining a machine, it was anything that doesn't have the benefit of a human identity to back its access, right? So right. it's kind of a broad definition where could be a cloud workload, it could be a microservice, yeah. a virtual machine, an AI sensor, at least these are the things I had in my head. And then I had some folks at the US Air Force come to us and they said, okay, well, you're saying machine, can you do real machines? Can you do <laughs> a controller on a shop floor? And uh, maybe a little bit of um, uh, hubris, but I was like, sure, of course we can, right? And so we started <laughs> delving into the OT space a few years ago and I was like, wow, this is pretty different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 
Today, it's been really fun to, you know, we're working with the Air Force to add strong identity access encryption for industrial networks and then able to use that same technology and platform to help them transition all the way to the cloud. Absolutely. So very, yeah, very um, interesting how things kind of bleed into each other when we start sort of uh, peeling back the onion a little bit here. Absolutely. You know, so one of the issues, you know, we talked about all these connections and all the different vulnerabilities and all the weak spots that can sort of turn up. It sort of leads into one of the biggest areas that is um, we've seen sort of an, an uptick in even more um, malicious activity, and that's for manufacturing supply chains. A lot more going on there. I have a feeling we there are so many more we don't know about and don't hear about. We hear about the big ones, you know, like Clorox, Dole Foods, where they got in through a software opening, and it really just it not only messed up production at those facilities, but then it led into the distribution, the retailers, the logistics providers, and impacts so many more companies, puts additional pressure to pay the ransom, all that kind of stuff. I'd really like to get your take in terms of what you're seeing on the supply chain level in terms of what are some of the, the trends the hackers are using to get in, some of the longer term effects, and, and maybe some of the best practices that you've seen to help ward off some of those attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the I think the, the cost itself has been ever increasing of a breach, yeah. right? So I think today the average total cost of a breach has reached an all time high with being an average of like, what, 4.5 million in US dollars, like over a 2% increase from the year before. And so particularly when we're talking about supply chain attacks and connecting more infrastructure, um, you sort of have to shore up the security of those connections and the data movement. You know, I think it is, twofold. There's certainly an increase in malware that's targeting the industrial control system itself, right? Um, And uh, I think leveraging existing vulnerabilities of um, equipment that we're seeing across manufacturing shop floors from some pretty uh, household names in terms of vendors. Um, But then also, you know, you alluded to like the supply chain attacks where What's really um, alarming about those is how they can be dormant and just kind of uh, reconnaissance focused for a while. And so really looking at more of that shift left into what's the code that's going into controllers? Like what's the, you know, asset that's being dropped into the industrial network and who's put eyes on it? Like who's looked at the, bill of materials, not just from a hardware perspective, but also from a software perspective. And then in terms of best practices, I think the the biggest thing is to kind of know and pin your network, right? Know and pin the connections, like up and down, um, whether it is, you know, the OT network or whether it is connections out, like basically, maintain that observability and control in a very dynamic way and have a good way to to really define what identity means, right? Um, mm. I think increasingly what we're seeing is the original definitions of machine identity, especially in industrial networks, like as an IP address, as a cryptographic key, like all of these hard-coded sort of simple definitions of identity don't hold up anymore, right? Yeah. And that's where we're seeing the defense in depth, the zero trust principles really making an impact. Like these, these whether they are introduced um, vulnerabilities or accidental ones, we have to assume they're gonna keep happening. Yeah, they're not they're not slowing down for sure. Like you said, I mean, the ransomware numbers are going up, even though they talk about some of these attacks in different areas going down. I would argue I think they're still very high. A lot of them still just don't get reported because they're happening to a lot of smaller organizations that didn't think they were a target. And then also that feeds off of what you were talking about, those live off the land or dwelling attacks. I think that is the biggest plague for a lot of these industrial control systems. People are just not understanding how to kick them out and yeah. they continue to get hit over and over again. It's very interesting and, and also kind of frightening. Yeah, and you know, it is, um, when you talk about the data that is available in these networks now, like just yeah. the 
the reconnaissance and data gathering that's possible is such a threat to like intellectual property, to supply yeah. chain production. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty existential. And so, you know, that's really industry 4.0 is like super exciting, but just expands the threat surface probably for these um, industrial networks like nothing has before. Yeah. So, like you said, the shared responsibility model of cloud, like really, you know, the the asset to protect there is the data itself. Yeah, absolutely. You've mentioned this a little bit already in terms of talking about the different um, reiterations of malware and some of the other threats that are out there. Are there any hacker groups or tactics that are maybe kind of lighting up your radar right now? Anything we should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I think what we have been really seeing is sort of evolving malware families. Like, you know, I alluded to it with like the the next generations of your Stuxnet or your Indestroyer 2.0. Like we're seeing a lot of variants of the same thing, maybe targeting different equipment or, you know, the other is the AI powered malware. Like I think we're gonna increasingly yeah. see AI driven reconnaissance where attackers are using that to, um, create phases of attacks and then like kind of be, you know, dynamically adjust them, right? So like yeah. dynamically sort of shift and map out more complex things that are working, not working. And that's, I think, again, goes back to just taking a very identity driven approach to, um, to defining what the network is. Yeah, they're becoming more advanced and they're learning the industrial network so much better. I mean, they saw the opportunity the hackers did and now they're in and you're right. They're adjusting their tactics once they get in there according to your enterprise. It's it's, yeah. it's really remarkable. Yeah, and you know, when you look at concepts like digital twins, right? Now all of a sudden you don't necessarily need physical access, right? Yeah. It's enough to perhaps compromise the, um, you know, the cloud repositories that are, are storing all of this to figure out what the vulnerabilities are. So I think there's, there's, that's what we are, are really looking at of like, you know, the learning aspects of it. Like when you are, when we're collecting data like this, what are the inferences you can make about it? Many of them are going to be positive and many of them are going to move the uh, industrial enterprise forward, and a lot of them are going to be revealing. Absolutely. You know, I want to go back to something you said previously, and I, I thought it was great about I, defining how you identify or how you, you identify different assets. I think that's a great point because sometimes we feel like cybersecurity is an off-the-shelf type of product, and it's not. It's highly customizable, and the way that you want to identify a machine can be different from somebody else. It's really a collaboration of, of best practices there. When we look at that and trying to implement that for getting some of the small to medium sized manufacturers more on board with cybersecurity, kind of going back to a previous question, how can we assure them that this is within their wheelhouse? Number one, they're still being targeted. This is important, but it's not going to be this overwhelming task that could maybe scare them off from, from really embracing it. Yeah, that's where I'm actually really excited about um, just like we are you know, trying to automate a lot of these industrial processes, like, you know, at Corsha, what we're looking at is like automating um, cybersecurity solutions, right? So yeah. what we do is we, we do make it very dynamic where we treat identity as the only perimeter and then having that observability, real-time control of the connections is great. What's even better is we're really excited about combating kind of even dynamic types of attacks by using AI ML for doing behavioral analysis, right? So yeah. where we look at what looks like a known good connection and suddenly isn't, what looks like anomalous traffic or malicious behavior, like we can leverage a lot of the technology today so that we can act as a force multiplier for small to mid-sized manufacturers. Um, you know, a lot of, there's some really interesting organizations out there, like the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes, like MXD, um, based out of Chicago, like the ARM Institute that's focused on robotics based out of Pittsburgh, um, Simani, which is, I believe, in Texas, where they are really looking at how to develop 
solutions that work for not just your massive enterprises like the US Air Force, but yeah. work for small to mid-sized manufacturers, right? Something that doesn't seem daunting to a company that doesn't have a cybersecurity staff. Yeah, no, I like the force multiplier analogy. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this has been great, Anusha. Looking down the road a little bit, what are some of the bigger trends that you're seeing maybe impacting cybersecurity in the industrial sector? Yeah, I mean, there's um, there's no shortage of them. Certainly, um, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think uh, I think as we've talked about, with greater automation comes a lot of cyber challenges and also a lot of opportunities, right? So, across manufacturing networks, enterprise cloud, there's there's increasingly a greater push and will be so in the next 12 to 18 months to scale and automate more. And that just yeah. further amplifies the need for like automated cyber solutions as well. They can keep pace. Um, I think one that is maybe re very relevant on the manufacturing side is adoption of 5G, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. And the rollout of 5G networks acceler that's going to bring accelerated faster speeds, lower latency is going to test the boundaries of some of our um, solutions and infrastructure and introduces new security challenges as well. <laughs> yeah, it does. Right? Um, yeah. Particularly around the increased number of connected devices back to identity, like how do you how do you identify known goods on this yeah. network that's now maybe a bit more ephemeral? Um, what I'm excited to see, and I, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we're going to see this is the expansion of zero trust architectures, where um, I think that zero trust security model really breaks down traditional network perimeters and focuses more on um, users identities and trust, but verify every single time, right. And, yeah. and that wider adoption, I think just kind of strengthens overall security baseline. And uh, as you alluded to, increased focused on like supply chain security, right? Yeah. Um, from soup to nuts, right? Where we're starting left all the way from code that goes into maybe a piece of um, a, a vendor's product all the way to how it stitches together and a greater reliance on defense and depth, like just an assumption that things uh, can and will go wrong. And how do we isolate impact um, yeah. in concentric circles or overlapping circles or however you want to look at it. Absolutely. Great stuff. You know, just wrapping up here a little bit, we've talked about a lot of things. And when you talk about cybersecurity, there is a tendency to talk about a lot of the negative or the challenges or the difficulties out there. The reality is we've come a long way. So when you go to sleep at night, what are some of the things that you can be reassured by and help you uh, help you get to sleep and not go to bed worrying about all these threats out there? Yeah. Um, we're having the right conversations like this one. Excited yeah. to be here. Um, and we have made a ton of progress, right? I think what's amazing, like I'll, I'll give you an anecdote from some of the work we're doing with the Air Force, where, as I said, we kind of started as a cloud first company and we're using very cloud native technologies that uh, things like Kubernetes, for example, right? And we are able to today deploy the same platform both to AWS and Google Cloud as we are able to put on the shop floor. And it's wow. because of all of the advancement of technologies like Kubernetes, like containers, like, you know, just all of the advancements that have been made in this space to allow us to t-shirt size solutions. And to yeah. me, that's super exciting, right? You don't have to be a large enterprise to make benefit of a uniform security baseline. Thanks, Anusha. And for more information on the work she and her colleagues are up to, you can check them out at Corsha.com. I'd also like to thank you for joining us today. And to catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check out Security Breach wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore in Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at ien.com. For Anusha Iyer, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.